Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show and here in San Francisco with a really a dear friend and a, and a recent friend, a healer, a rhythmist, and an artist, Dave Mahali. Welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you. Thank you for coming here. Can you talk a little bit about how you, at this point in your career, try to pass the music and the knowledge on? What is the most effective way to do that with not just your students, but even tonight on the bandstand. I mean, how how do you want to pass the, pass it forward? I think I just want to communicate uh, joy. Um, and I'm not sure career is the right word for me, but uh, in any case, yeah, well, I, I, I find mean, it a devotion. I know yeah. there's people who find the electric uh, allure of sound who are much younger than me who come to hear it and I just it's it's something that you it's it's knowledge that you pass from generation to generation or from people to people and sometimes it can be um joy is healing and uh and it's just endlessly fascinating if you're interested in music and you go hear music live and you see people play it could be really edifying I know it is for me, and it's just being another another part in that continuum. Were you primarily sort of learning from your elders, the pharaohs, and the not just the jazzers, but everybody through osmosis, or were you picking their brains too back in the day? I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, we're talking now, but like we talked about before, Calvin Hill, Bonner, Pharaoh, Munoz, I cannot, I'm gonna go back to the well so many times, I wouldn't have needed, if I was a musician, I would have been completely introspective after that stuff. I mean, to me, that's more osmosis learning as opposed to picking their brains. But were you kind of, did you have people that you would go and talk to about, I don't know, beyond technique? Or, yeah, I would, well, beyond beyond technique. I had people I would talk to about technique. Right. I would go see um, Andrew Cyril, and he, um, wow. my... my Aunt, when I was 12, she gave me, she knew I played drums, so I was 12 years old, she gave me a pair of brushes. And I had the brushes, and I, you know, I'm 12 years old, I really wanted, I really, really wanted kind of the vivid, bright, big sound of the drums. I didn't really understand what they did, Right. the brushes. I played them a little bit, and I just put them aside until I was 21, and I called up Andrew Cyril from the back of the Village Voice, and I said, I really, I want to take a lesson with you, I just want to sit with you in your place, if I could. He said, okay, so I went to his studio. Um, he had a studio in Times Square, and I brought the brushes, and he was talking to me about sound, and I had the brushes, and he said, when you have the brushes, you kind of make a shape like this, and I, and I was, didn't really understand. I'm like, well, do you? And I was trying to maybe to over-intellectualize it, like, I don't understand. And he got kind of frustrated, and he grabbed my hands, and he moved my hands over the surface of the drums, and I had an epiphany, and then he showed me a few patterns that he wrote down, and I went back to where I was living. I was living with a bunch of musicians, and I played duos with a guitar player named Mike Elias, and immediately I, I could understand, oh, oh, it, the drums move, the brushes move on a horizontal field, not just vertical, but horizontal, mm. and that makes, a sh that makes sound. It could be continuous, it could be choppy, it could be angular. And uh, so I would go for technique with people. And I went Barry Archer, I asked him. I had, went to his place in the Lower East Side. He has those classic drum set that's on the cover of... When he lived in Alphabet City or something? Yeah, when he lived in the Lower East Side. And he had a big drum set there with all the bells. And dude, the dude lots is of a, cymbals. the nastiest dude. And he tuned his drums really high, they were yeah. melodic. And um, he said to me, Make a sound, make another sound, make another sound, make another sound, Jeez. make another sound, <laughs> make another sound. And he just did this after a while to the point where I realized all oh, these kind of infinite sounds in this thing. And then he said, if you're gonna come to New York, you better be ready. <laughs> and I, I took that to heart, like, okay, I hear you. And it's about sound. How do you tune it? Where do you strike a symbol? So I did go, get technique from people, especially when it comes to the drums. With drums, I really studied the drums. 
When can you talk a little bit to the audience about you? Because you talked about Elias before playing in Jersey. Yeah. What, did you? Can you talk about when you were finally quote unquote ready to come to New York? Did that, when did that materialize and how that happened? Well, it's just being in New Jersey. I mean, you just you just show up. Back, back basically, that's just the time. No, I'm not. Yeah, it's the time I, of punk rock. Totally. You know? So and um. I'm talking about singing for your supper in New York, not coming in to see get shows. But yeah, like, I know. really, I never, I would go and play in clubs in New York, but I wasn't really making any kind of money. Right, so you couldn't, there. you weren't. Yeah, but I it, wasn't singing for my supper. I was, I was young and green, and um, big. but I was absorbing stuff. I didn't really learn more of that until I moved out west, and then when I would play gigs back there. But um, I mean, I'm relatively obscure. But uh, I am definitely devoted. And I'm, not, I'm really into I'm really into the sound and playing, and uh, still expanding my vocabulary and repertoire. But now on all different kinds of instruments. But really, my mother tongue was and was the drum set, even into kind of harmonic music and melodic music. Um, talk a little bit about your, the other instruments. I mean, other percussion, your string instruments. What do you I work? I play. With? I play guitars. Uh, and different tunings. I was playing guitar as a 16 year old, but it was always my kind of private instrument. I was basically at first a strummer, just strumming chords and learning that. And uh, and then with, I would just start writing things right away on the guitar. And then I started to learn how to play single string things and scales and modes and bass lines. And uh, I took it to heart and I did, I've been playing for, you know, guitar for almost 50 years now and the piano was a forbidden instrument to me and my family boys were not allowed to play piano so I'd have to sneak away to play I'm sorry piano. was it the, the, they were the two boogie woogie wasn't allowed in the house or it wasn't boogie woogie or was too feminine or something it, it, it it's not really clear what it was I think I, I think it. it had to do with it being too feminine but I'm only well, you said boys weren't allowed to play That's no why all the girls that. in my family took lessons and none of them played anymore because they had a very strict yeah because someone put a dog collar on him and had him, you know, they, they made yeah, him just miserable. learning yeah. etudes and not yeah. really exploring what a piano can really do. But I fell in love with the piano and I realized piano had a connection to the drums because it is percussive, it's touch, and it has a connection to the guitar because it's harmonic and it's melodic and it's about bass lines. So over the course of decades, I've started to form this gestalt with those, those three groups. Mm. And then instruments that are related to those, like marimbas and vibes, or banjos and mandolins, or organs and electronic keyboards, they're all in that family. So that's big. And it's, um, so that's, those are the instruments that I mostly deal with, that those three groups. The keyboards, the stringed instruments that you play with your fingers, and uh, percussion instruments. Would you say that... Uh... Can you talk a little bit about a surreal moment you might have had with one of your students where you, maybe you didn't take their hands and show them the horizontal and uh, patterns of the brushes, but um, where you know that the cat walked out of here and it was newfound truths for, the, for them. I mean, th that to me is exactly the question that I was asking before about surreal past was passing knowledge to you. You have students now. Yeah. Is there, it doesn't have to be the exact example, is there a way to talk about how you have infused certain enlightenment in your students? Well, I mean, outside one, of one thing I can remember recently is just having a real big, uh, playing in this room with a giant, with a big 22 inch Zildjian rod symbol, very heavy, big symbol that somebody gifted to me 30 years ago. And this young drummer came over, very enthusiastic, really open headed. And um, mm. just showing them just how the different spots on the cymbal have different sounds, almost as if they're different instruments. And then different implements that you strike the cymbal with, having yet another uh, vocabulary of instruments, and then rubbing the cymbal and making friction, that all of a sudden one cymbal becomes... It's not just something that you smack. You can smack it, but it, there's a thousand things you can do with one symbol. So I remember him being like, "I want to get it. I want to get a, a nice big symbol, you know? <laughs> rather than just the having, gateway open, like yeah. like a symbol that you know. Usually people get like their first drum set, 
a lot of times with any drum set, you can make it sound kind of good, but cymbals, not so much. You, if you get a nice cymbal, could be it could be a vintage cymbal, it could be a new cymbal, just a nice quality cymbal that has lots of sounds in it. It's it's stunning to people who grew up. We were talking about recorded music before, where you have you listen to a a rock track or something, and the there's a psh, you know there's that sound, and really that's really all that you hear. But there's all this nuance that inside of a cymbal timbre and tonality yeah that you only hear in a really good recording or if you're in a live situation and especially if you're sitting behind a drum set with a something in your hand a stick a brush a chopstick a mallet whatever it might be and you're striking a cymbal just that is a revelation just a symbol and your touch and what do you touch it with you uh do you think you had a, or developed over time a definitive ride cymbal uh sound for yourself i mean mike clark talked about that being a huge issue today with younger jazz drummers just uh they don't seem to recognize the ride symbol uh, or that that to me he's like that's where the soul all my that was my dna was my ride symbol pattern oh so, that's cool yeah and i just wonder about um you know, you, not that you were, you know, ripping in the vanguard and you weren't, you know, you, no, you're not a jazz purist, but. Um, yeah, I'm not. But I am a, I'm, I, I am a deep. Diversity. You're a painter on the drums. Yeah. And I do think I do have a, 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 a voice on the cymbal. You do? The cymbals. Yeah, I really love the cymbals. And I've listened to so much. Jack DeJeanette, Paul Moten, Billy Higgins, Susie yeah. Ibarra, Billy Higgins, Ed Blackwell, oh, yeah. Elvin Jones. The way that you could not just play ding, 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 ding. You could break that pattern up. You play on different parts of the cymbal. You can let the cymbal go for a while. You can just play the cymbal like Tony Williams would sometimes. There's so many things you would do that I do do things unconsciously now. Right. That when I listen back... I couldn't really tell you what they are, but I think that what they are, they're melodic fragments, but they have a rhythmic momentum. And uh, sometimes it's a steady thing that can create momentum. But sometimes if you break that up, that can create interest. Some people see that as being disruptive, but other other times it could be, just, I think, just really lyrical. It could be lyrical. Can you talk? I would love you to talk about. I don't care what genre, but I'm obsessed with breaking up time and form. And some people have. That's what you said. It breaks. Mo some people are irritated by it, or it breaks momentum. But can you talk about a, a live experience where you, the band, was getting off on consistently breaking up time and form in songs? I saw this one time. I saw an Anthony Braxton. Uh, I think it was called the Ghost Dance Music. It was at Yoshi's in Oakland. Yeah. And he had this series of chords. I don't know if it was ever recorded. And it was a giant horn ensemble. And they were playing a continuum of harmonic information. They were reading. It never repeated. So they were breaking up time, but their cycles of time were longer than a set would allow. Right. Maybe it was even longer than the whole week at the club would allow. But the cycles of time were just thinking about times. You can think of time being like a one bar form is repeating, a two bar form. Okay, an eight bar form is repeating, a 16 bar form is repeating, 32 bar form is repeating. Now you're talking about a 128 bar form is repeating. And it becomes, you're talking almost like yugas. You're talking about ages where maybe it's a cycle, but it's a cycle. Can you perceive that cycle? So that was kind of a, a, a Satori moment. <clears throat> well, that, I mean, that's that absolutely show, Satori. You know? uh, but in your own, I mean, Braxton, that's going to the infinite right there. Yeah, what a, what a conceptualist. What about you in terms of like punk? Or, I mean, can you, is that, uh, were you able to, 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 I don't know, break things down and build them back up in sort of more of a, I don't know what the right word is, but in, in, a, in a more square, I don't want to say square, but punk format, for instance. Uh, well, I did love the guy who played drums in the Minutemen. He had a concept that was... What was his concept? Um, it was imagination. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, punk became a brand uh, to me. And so, did, and so did 
jazz kind of. Yeah, absolutely. Well, everything becomes brand, something yeah. they sell and it and something that you're replicating. But the drums, like that guy who played, I should be, I wish I could say his name. I should oh, the Minutemen. We'll have to get to this name yeah, immediately. Yeah, the Minutemen. Uh, that drummer had that. Um, Stuart Copeland had that, the way he would chop up beats. He wasn't quite, quite wasn't punk, but they kind of came out of the punk energy totally. vibe, you know. The Ramones, I didn't think I liked, but the drummer in that band, the original drummer, he had that vicious right hand. Like, wow, that's wild. It's almost like it would just, it would just blow my hand up <laughs> to play like that. But it was fascinating, you know? Yeah. Um, and then there was a band in San Francisco called uh, Animal Things. Fairly obscure. I saw them play at the old uh, hotel, um, Temple Beautiful, next to the film, where it was uh, right where Jim Jones' uh, temple was that got, that burned down. Um, when you, I wanted you said something interesting. You said that the rocking. that jazz punk became branded, and then it, it was necessary to replicate it, which is the antip. It's that's antithetical to jazz. I mean, you don't want to replicate. But right, yet, the tradition is, is... To be yourself. The tradition, yeah, the tradition is evolution. So would you say the repli replication had everything, was the primary thing with repli replication, if that's the word, is confining the rhythm to make it more static, make it more straight. Yeah, As a, you have, because you're learning, because you're learning from these people that were masters once upon a time, and you're learning what they did but if you're not extending upon it, you're, you're, you're it's your cover band, or I mean, not. Well, but, but my point is, if you're trying to commercialize something, and then, and then, then you don't want to take a risk of pushing it forward. And then there's that. Yeah, that, that's what I thought you were. Or there's people who, who I don't want to hear that. Absolutely. I don't. I don't want to hear. Not that everything has to be an innovation, because there is nice stuff about if you're if you're gonna play bluegrass, you're gonna study Earl Scruggs. How does he play the banjo? It's like, oh wow, or uh, how did. Uh, you know Clarence White, or you know yeah, any, yeah, anybody, or or you know with jazz, how did uh, how did Bud Powell play? Can you reach that level? Can you can you <laughs> can you you know wow? But, but everybody, everything is finite. Um, and then when I you guess, talk I about guess that could yeah. be marketed, uh, you know, mercantile aspects and music. It's like the uh, Hindu deities of Sarasvati and uh, Mahalakshmi. They're not always. Uh, in you know, one is dealing with money and one is dealing with creativity. It's, they, they don't always have great conversations, <laughs> dude. Dave Mahali, dude, I, going around the world here. I mean, <laughs> with the Ramones, the that was big. The early, the Minutemen. What year? Or late seventies, early eighties, kind of stuff. Yeah, early eighties, early eighties. But I guess in in the when punk first hit, they were just like. Playing full on blazing, and they were innovators too. They were, but they didn't have a lot of technique. But they had a lot. The guy who played in the Clash, yes, the guy who plays on um, "Go Straight to Hell," that track, that track. I studied that track. The percussion on that that's that's amazing. On um, combat rock, so there's some there's jewels all over the place. To it, me, it it's. Do you think it became? That early period when it was not branded as much, there was more freedom, and then over time it became a little bit more. There was more. It was I don't know what the right word codified or more. Yeah, yeah. I think that happens with everything. Yeah, I think that's just that's just how things cycle through. You know, I, I often talk about my own issues sometimes with insecurity and pride, and you know. You're, I sit here now talking to you and, you know, records and books and you've been ensconced in rhythm your whole life, but was there a definitive, was there a moment in your life when you had to get out, learn, learn to get out of your own way and, and sort of, um, oh yeah, can you talk about, <laughs> like, because you know, ego yeah. is that one thing that I love about bands that I, I'm willing to go and tour to see yeah, is that that you know there's they might not be always on top of things but when it comes to the bandstand there is no ego it's just a conversation someone will take the lead but you know there's such a, there's so many musicians and there's so many there's so much dedication to and impetus put on certain things and i just wonder if you can talk a little bit about how 
you learn to get out of your own way and at the same time become more at peace with who you were as a person. I, a couple times I played, I played in a band that was, uh, I was invited to play in a band that was all Tropicalia music. It was Caetano Veloso, um, wow. Tom Zay, Tom Zay. And I had, was getting calls to play in a lot of different groups and I was playing with them all. And I, maybe I was a little full of myself but I went to this rehearsal, and the, the forms were so creative and alien to me. I realized I gotta, I gotta get out of my own way. I gotta stretch. I have to study this. And it also happened to me in a Chinese band that I played with with a great singer named um, Lord Donna, and she did not like the snare drum. She's like, "Don't play that." <laughs> I'm like, don't play the snare. Don't, don't play the snare. Okay, but I'm, I try to, but I know that she knows what she's talking about. So she's talking about palettes of cymbals and wood blocks. So I also had to get on my way there. Like, I want to play this music. And it wasn't like it was traditional Chinese music. It was kind of like Chinese punk and Chinese jazz. But from a singer's point of view, the snare drum, I could play some snare drum, but she didn't want snare drum all the time. She, you know, she never saw electric guitar until she was 30 years old. Yeah. She didn't know who the Beatles were. Right. She, they saw pictures of, I made a record about Muhammad Ali called The Ali Suite, and I brought it to China, and the, and the portrait of Muhammad Ali on the cover by Stephen Rice, and people asked me, is this a picture of you? I said, what? This is, that's, that's not a picture of me. But uh, just because people sometimes have racial, they're blind, you know? It happens to, to to white folks, it happened to black folks, it happened to people that are Chinese. It's like, anyway, there's been lots of times I had to get on my own way. I, I just want to be clear, like with the with the Chinese, uh, the no snare drum, the, my first inclination, maybe like you don't want to play the snare. I mean, it's a staple of the rhythm kit, you know, so then all of a sudden my ego would be invested, but you were like, well, this is not, I mean, it's it, it sounds easier said than done, but you really have to say, Okay, you know. Let me try. Let me try something else. But there's other things. That's what I'm do. open. That's a, yeah. keeping the open. How yeah, yeah. you learn to keep it open? Yeah. I mean, some people would say. Or this is the break on the, the. Uh, Tom Zay song. The break happens there, and then there's a. That's where the break is. Like wow, that is ingenious. I would never do that on my own. <laughs> right. So that was something that was good to learn about a form, because that came from a form. That was a form that was really fresh to me. It was like I was a beginner again. Wow. So there's lots of, there's, there's lots of examples of it. You're a beginner, but yet you're not starting from scratch, right? I mean, it's more right. about pushing yourself out of your comfort zone to learn something new. And I think yeah. a lot of people tend to get, well, that's that that's the issue is that I, you know, I just, I, I'm working on another book and um, I forget who said it, of course, now, but... Um, Basically, you know, when you become satisfied as an artist, creativity ceases to exist. Can you riff on how you keep an edge even now? I mean, have you ever gotten complacent or satisfied or, you know, and does do you think that do you think that's an accurate thing? Do you think it does stifle creativity when you get satisfied? Some people get fame, uh, fortune, or they get used to a formula trip or they can't even perform live. They're just completely, you know, they're making money based on auto tune and stuff. And they just, to me, that's where creativity ends. I mean, I sort of have to push myself over the edge to stay, uh, irascible. I try to play with people when I have my own groups that play music that I don't know a lot about. And I think that keeps me fresh. Um, I the, band, the band tonight you're playing with, yeah, is that, one of the band tonight. Can you tonight. talk a little bit about because of the instrumentation? It's it's world music, really. Yeah, so. it's a band. It's I mean, it's a band that has a a man in it named Ahmed Maseli Ragab, and he plays the oud. He also plays nice darbuka. He also plays good drum set, really good electric bass. Wow. But in this band, he plays oud and percussion. And um, he grew up in Cairo, and he grew up part of the time in Japan. So he knows about these music that are in his mother tongue that are things that I've heard on record, but I've I've learned some of the modes on a guitar 
although the guitar didn't have the micro microtonal qualities and the tone of it is just I've fallen in love with it but it's not anything that I grew up with uh, and I love playing with him it's just refreshing and I think when I accompany him I since I'm really so attenuated to melody that pushes me around the piano player Dusty Kashi Feathers is from Mashad Iran and he knows all these modes that are similar to the Arabic modes, but they're a little bit different. They're Persian. Right. And he also spent time in England, so he has all this kind of English lore that he knows. Uh, I know him more at playing uh, metal percussion, but now he's playing piano. He, go, he goes to places where him and Ahmed can converse, and all of a sudden they're in the Middle East, and I'm just going, this is fantastic. Uh, so I You're think playing sort of like... In the meter of seventeen, or, or it could be it yeah. could be cycles of time, or it could also be just combinations of notes that aren't what you think of as it's, this is a this is a melodic major I scale. Did. I did. This is a this is a this this is a major scale. This is a melodic minor scale. No, this one has a minor second. It's like, oh, that has a flavor, and then there's just many many of those. Some you could do on the piano. Some you can't even do on the piano. You have to do it on a. An instrument like an oud that has no frets. Uh, and that's just one example of staying out of a complacent zone. Although I do like, I like my playing. I don't think I'm the greatest drummer in the world, but I really feel like I'm just trying to express myself and I, and I don't think there's really end to learning. I don't think there's an end to learning. I've never really ach achieved fame or fortune as a player, but I always looked at it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind fortune. Fame, I, I think, it could be probably a curse. I think overrated. Yeah. I don't think. I, I don't think Never I, tasted it. I'm so not really worried know. about yeah. that. Yeah. But uh, I always thought of it like you're learning a martial art or something. Mm. It's like you're you're never going to get to the end of learning, and uh, so there's no really room for complacency because it's just it's not in the equation. The difference though is that some cats, as you get older, or just in general, you have to stay curious and you have to continue to be a seeker. I yeah. mean, you know, otherwise, then you will stagnate. You know, I mean, to me, you have to, I don't know, I give you a lot of credit for putting yourself in position. What do you like to do when those cats are conversing in the Middle Eastern language? Do you just kind of like to play, are you playing guitar tonight or? I'm playing drums and guitar. So when you, when they get into the Middle Eastern thing and you're. Sometimes I just listen. Yeah. Sometimes I play percussion and I, and I just play what I hear. I don't have to play in some kind of orthodox uh, way yeah. because I'm playing a drum set. I mean, a drum set. The vernacular of a drum set is from Chicago to New Orleans. I mean, that's how the drum set was invented, then spread worldwide. But you can play a drum set with your hands. You could mute drums. You can do different things. You could play lyrically on the cymbal in a way that just kind of pushes the music along. This isn't any kind of um, uh, Orthodox Middle Eastern group either. They're they're very worldly beings. They're wide open. And and the way the world is, I mean, people have heard everything. If, if you're a curious musician, you've listened to a lot of music from all over the world, regardless of where you were born. So this is why this group is pretty cool. And the guitar players from Queens, Michael Cavasano, who's a Hendrix fiend and a Baden Powell fiend. Are you and, kidding me? And then um, the horn player plays cornet he plays alto he plays clarinet he plays cello and violin so he's just this polyglot musician who who's knowledgeable from a theoretical point of view but he's just a very intuitive humble musician jeff hobbs so this is a super band you know it's a beautiful band and uh, where is it gonna cats can they just eat dinner or they can they dance is it a dance you could you could eat it's called the mercury cafe it's just it's an art cafe that's in the lower height, and uh, they have good food, and they have a full coffee bar, and they have wine. But it, it used to be a, a art gallery called Eth Ethnic Trip, and it has really exquisite uh, ac acoustics. It has beautiful acoustics, and the people that run the cafe and who work at the cafe are all, in some degree, artists. So it's a very strange situation in San Francisco now where people think it's all tech, and purely mercantile. I mean, this place, they have to make a living, but it's not just purely about that. It's about a creative, electric, little scene. But like Marshall Allen said, a little scene is still a scene. 
Marshall Allen, the yeah. bass player. I love that you just said that. The guy who played with Sun Ra, who's alive still in his 90s. I'm still trying to get... No, I, my yeah. buddy Tim Pleasant played with... I love drummers. Unbelievable that you just dropped that. A little scene is still a seed. A little scene is still a seed. Like, things come from a... A sunflower comes out of a seed. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very vibrant scene, and all the gigs get recorded. So it's a, it's a, for me, it's like it's um. Is there is there a, a room? I mean, you're not an economist, and you're not. I'm not an economist. A developer or anything like that. Is there room for that scene to grow? Do you think from a little or or as because society now? I'm just saying this based on road dog touring. All, since coming out of the pandemic, especially, everything's kind of gridded. You get, you know, it's you, these are the times you're going to go on tour. And I'm just wondering from a regional point of view, being that this was a hotbed of activity and it definitely grew into a massive sunflower during the days of Basin Street West, Jazz Workshop, all that stuff. Will our society, even in, in a liberal bastion of the Bay Area, do you see that there's opportunity for it to continue to grow? Yes. I think that's the only way to proceed. Yes. It's vibrant and it's alive and people are interested in it and there's always new people. It's part of the continuum. Right. What it will be, I don't know. It's almost like I feel like a, an old Kabbalist or something and just you're passing on lore and you're... Are you awesome. Jewish? I that's I, I told someone this. Kabbalistic, I'm, you know. I'm part Jewish yeah. and someone said you can't be part Jewish. I am part Jewish. No, dude, I'm I'm part. My dad's hey! Jewish. My mom's Catholic. I, what are they doing? It's you know, but but I mean, but I grew up a Lutheran. Yeah. My grandfather defected from Catholicism. There were Jews my in my God. family that had to convert, and there's others that I don't even know. Yeah. I mean, I have Kuan Yin behind me. <laughs> I, I just believe in spirit. I'm not really. Yeah, I, no, I'm with you. But yeah. but but Kabbalah is fascinating, and so is the I Ching, and so is Tarot, and so is drums. And piano and guitar <laughs> and all of it. So it, it's interesting to be interested in things. There's lots of things to be interested in. It's pretty vivid. One one uh, one thing before I let you go. Uh, yeah. I just wanted you to, you know, um, Oliver Ray is a dear friend. And, um, you know, he is really from a, obviously, playing with Patti Smith, he he he's steeped in a lot of all different types of music, but he's singer songwriter uh, yeah. primarily. Um, but yet, on a good night, I can feel. I mean, his spirit transcends who he even is as a person. Sure. Can you just talk about the magic of o Oliver Ray and and ultimately what you love playing? Why you love playing with him? First time I ever met him, I was in Mark Matos's ah. courtyard. He had a place. Um, and Oliver Ray came over. It was the day that Ornette Coleman died, I remember. And he had a smile. He sat down. I felt like I recognized him. And we just talked for quite a while. I felt like, I love this guy. He's great. But when he plays, when he plays the guitar, he's in that, he's kind of in a genreless, he's in a post genre state. He's playing melodies over the drum, just like. Ali Akbar Khan does over uh, Ala Raka. It's, sure. the, it's the same kind of root. It's it's ancient and it's also futuristic. Plus, Oliver Ray is really conversant in literature and poetics. And I think from that, he comes to a very, very expansive worldview. And he's a very worldly man. He's traveled. I've seen his record collection. He's got a vast collection of music. He's interested in many, many things. Uh, and I have his records. I love his song uh, about it. your father was an old coyote. Old coyote, it's my favorite. He's a great. You know, he's in he's in the realm of folklore, but he's also in the in the realm of um, punk and jazz. You know, yeah, expansive music of all varieties: Western classical music, Indian music, blues, and the whole sound of Tucson. I remember asking him, "What's your thing?" Has Tucson changed your music? He said, yes. It's like, we burned out anything in me that was extraneous. It's just purely about space. And uh, playing with him is, I love playing with Oliver Ray. He's a wonderful player. 
He's a beautiful singer, great lyricist, and a, I love the way he he plays the guitar, the way he bends the strings, and he uses volume kind of like those people that did that. They kind of are sort of like imitating horn players because they're playing with a lot of sustain. You just nailed it. I mean, I just hope Dave Mahali, you know, what whatever comes first, road trip to New York or we we'll get you down to Tucson to play some gigs, but yeah, I really that's the next step. I I, uh, I haven't been out of San Francisco in two years. Well, that's okay, and it is okay. It's been a very vivid place to be. It's, a lot of space has been created here due to the tragedy of the whole coronavirus phenomenon. But uh, there's space been, in the sense that people moved out or just passed away. People have moved out. Okay, there's not a lot of people died here. Some people did. Yeah. But mostly people moved out and they created space. Sometimes those spaces were not filled. Some of the places that were great closed, which is sorrowful. But there's been some new little things that have opened up. And there's just more space here now. Uh, I would like to do some traveling, but I've done a lot of traveling in my life. And uh, I've been trying to develop my own music here with a bunch of really great allies of people who live in the Bay. I certainly would, I did go to Portugal in 2020, right before the pandemic, and I played with Mark Matos, and that was great. We played with two wonderful horn players there, a man named Floppy, wow. Alexander Samoas, and, a, and a, a young guy who plays uh, baritone and tenor, Miguel Latau. Uh, but that was the last time I've taken any kind of a significant trip besides going to Tucson once. Well, you're darn lucky too, because Mark, Mark Matos got ravaged by COVID after that in Portugal. Yeah, he did get he sick. He was out for a while. He did. That's when that, that first wave. But we're feeling blessed here on the Jake Feinberg Show. Dave Mahali, man. Yeah, we're, we're vibrant. We, we, we weathered it. And who knows what's yet to be. But it's, it's good just to keep going. Keep the pulse, man. Tension and release. That's, <laughs> what, that's what it's about. Much yeah. love, dude. Much, Much love. love to you. Thank yeah. you for being here. Thank you for visiting. It's the Jake Feinberg Show. We'll see you later. Adios.